Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sego ani buju endio wachaya kwekwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as a gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who were entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community, having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. So with that, we will officially call to order. Madam Deputy Clerk, do we have a quorum? Yes, Mayor Patterson, we have quorum. Very good. Um, nothing under Committee of the Whole closed meeting, so we'll move to the approval of the edits. For the edits, we have uh, a withdrawal of a delegation and then two additional delegations. And then we have an additional report from the CAO, an item of miscellaneous business and some communications. Can I have a mover for the edits, please? Moved by Deputy Mary Hill, seconded by Councillor Osanek. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none, we have no presentations this evening, uh, but we do have two delegations. So delegation number one has been withdrawn, so uh, we will invite Mary Lou McCartney, Staff Representative, Kingston Regional Office, Ontario Public Services Employees Union, to uh, speak to Council with respect to new motion number one regarding addiction and mental health services, Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington. And just a reminder to our delegations that you have five minutes. Thank you. Your Worship, Mayor Patterson, Councillors, thank you for giving us an opportunity to speak to this issue. We as a delegation are very concerned with the changes proposed by the supervisor appointed by the Southeast Lynns to the housing program and other services at the Addiction Mental Health Services at KFLNA. But we will be speaking specifically to the housing reductions. Currently, clients are housed in different locations for reasons specific to their needs. There is a lower union which is staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week for complex vulnerable residents. Um, it, it is a harm reduction home. Gardner Street has daytime staff for more mobility and health related plus mental health concerns for their clients. West Street is staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week and is considered a behavioral home for very mentally ill, vulnerable clients. Albert Street is staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week housing dual diagnosed individuals with developmental delays and mental health concerns. John Street is staffed 9 a.m. to 12 a.m. It is a forensic home that has a contract with Province Care Hospital for community integration. The proposed plan we have will have lower union eliminated, Gardner Street sold, but clients are to remain. It is our understanding that once a house is sold, that new owners can evict the tenants if they so choose. We are not sure that this can be guaranteed. The plan will have Albert Street, John Street, and West Street come together at the new Lion Street location along with the 10 units that are for the city of Kingston. It is our concern that combining these three homes could be counterintuitive to the welfare of these residents as their care plans are very different. Along with staffed houses, historically AMHS has provided compassionate housing for some of Kingston's most vulnerable and mentally ill residents. By compassionate, we refer to the 10 houses including a building on Conacher Drive. That house, that house many complex vulnerable people. If a unit or house gets damaged, we have compassionate maintenance workers that come in and fix the damage so that they can remain there. In any other setting, these people will likely be evicted. The supervisor's plan is to sell these homes and if this happens, there is no going back and undoing, undoing what has been done. Where will these people go? We know that they have been hard to house and that is why they have been in our housing program. We are not reducing the client needs, just moving the need to other services such as police, emergency rooms and hospitals, paramedic services and jails. 
we will have more police contact, more hospital visits, and perhaps more suicides. On a housing survey that was done over a period from October 2017 to October 2018, Kingston had a vacancy rate of only 0.6%, which is 1% lower from the previous year. City Councillor Jim Neal in a Global News report identified affordable housing as a number one priority for our city. Low vacancy rate increased rates, which adds to the unavailability of our housing for our most vulnerable residents. An average two bedroom unit is $1,200. For example, if a resident is on Ontario Disability Support Program, or ODSP, they would receive for one person $631 for their basic needs and $479 for their shelter. If they were to do boarding or lodging, the total amount would be $784. How do they secure affordable, safe housing where they may have monitoring? People who help them make sure they take their medications, make sure that they're, they have life skills. So we ask that the city go back to the supervisor at AMHS and Paul Haras at the Southeast Linz and ask them to pause their plan so that a proper review can happen. Will, with all stakeholders, other service providers who provide housing shelters, police, paramedic services, provincial jails, hospitals, clients who use these services, and create a sustainable plan for our community and our residents over a period of three to five years. Some of our clients may be immediately successful in the new proposed housing, achieve a full recovery, and flourish in our community. We hope so. But change is hard. It is much it is too much to expect that everyone will be immediately successful at the same time. Relapse is normal in these situations. Mental illness is challenging. Client's recovery will not follow any supervisor's timelines. The supervisor has been appointed for one year. She's already six months into her term. So these changes will be happening within six months. 30 seconds. Um, we are not against change. As a matter of fact, any successful organization goes through reviews, but we are dealing with vulnerable people. Changes need to be done with compassion and mindfulness over a longer period of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Yeah. Councilor Kiley? Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. Thank you for your presentation. Could you talk to us a bit about the consultation that happened with frontline staff uh, in respect to how this change would impact clients? how that was presented. Yeah, you mentioned yes. that this has been going yes. on for about six months. Yes, um, the supervisor was put into place in December and in approximately mid to late March, approximately 200 staff were brought into the main, one of the main rooms at Addiction Mental Health at 552 Princess and it was put up as a PowerPoint presentation where it identified all the different programs that would be eliminated as well as that's how people found out that their jobs would be eliminated as well. Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so prior to, under the original operation, operations, I guess, procedures, when clients came to um, MHS for service, how did they come, how did they get into the housing to begin with? What was the intake process like at the outset originally, I guess? I'm gonna defer to my colleague. Thank you. Housing is one of the many different services that the agency has offered. A person would apply to that. A person could apply to vocational. They could ask for support with case management. They could have asked for support with housing. So clients coming to housing had been traditionally clients with higher needs who had a mental health diagnosis, as well as a difficult time finding housing within the Kingston area. So these clients with complex mental health needs, addictions, concerns, we're looking for support to maintain that stable housing within the Kingston area. These were, the, the, the common plan had been to graduate people out, to move them off onto their own and to not remain within housing. So anyone who is currently within housing was always on a sort of a progression out to back and further you know, reintegrate with the community. Anyone still there has not yet been successful at that journey yet. Um, Mary Lou's point was that thinking they'll all be successful immediately transitioning all at once is, is something that we just, this, the program has not yet ever shown. It's a lot to think that everyone will be successful getting new housing and living on their own all at once in the next few weeks. Thanks, and so the number of clients um, to date who are housed that would be losing their housing, can you speak to that? I don't have a client number. Oh, 
We don't have specific numbers. It would just be a guesstimate. There would be, we believe, 37 units in the Line Street house, um, and then the 10 units that the that are unstaffed, the houses that are through the community that are unstaffed, there are four to six clients in each of those. So I, I imagine the question is, is what happens to those clients as those residents are, are sold? Councillor Chappelle. Thank you, through your chair. I understand that many of the clients that you're servicing are complex in nature, uh, not typically the type of people that you would find at a, a, um, a larger corporate um, apartment, what have you. I was wondering if you could describe the complexity in trying to find housing for people if they don't have such a supportive housing facility available. Like how difficult, have you run into examples? Can you give me a, like a case study of trying to transition someone from one of those homes to a, a, a regular residence? That is a, a brilliant question, which almost perfectly describes the answer. Um, because people, some of them might have substance use concerns that other um, co-tenants or landlords might have found problematic. Um, some of them might have daily routines that are not what we would consider our own routine and their, their hours of, of being awake and being asleep do not necessarily fit. Um, the, your, your question is excellent. There are any numer, numerous number, of, huge number of challenges um, which are presented. Help me out. Yeah. So if when we talk about reducing three of the houses into one at Lyon Street, the reason that the houses are separate right now is they're, they're very complex individuals in each of them. Uh, one of the houses I had identified as harm reduction. And what that means is that they are able to use drugs in a safer place. But if you take a forensic house and you put that into that, it totally contradicts what the forensic clients are not allowed to do, which is they are not allowed to use any substances. So in the forensic house, there would be no substances whatsoever, but in the, the house with the harm reduction, there might be some people who are using in a safer way. And then the forensic clients then have, have access to drugs which there are not supposed to be around. And we also throw in developmentally challenged individuals who have mental health issues who are inc incredibly vulnerable. And then those individuals are highly manipulated by some of the other residents in those houses. So it, the concern is that mixing these individuals together could really have a poor outcome. And then what happens to these people? They end up being on our streets, perhaps homeless, or perhaps back in eMERGE. We know that the staffing in the houses help keep those people, these individuals who are vulnerable, residents of our community, we help them keep them in a safe place where perhaps they can get the services that they need to be successful outside once they graduate. And we're, we're hopeful if, this, if you, you pass this motion that you'll meet some of them. There are a number of success players, a number of people who do very, very well, and, and their, their lives now look quite different from what they did five years ago. Our comment is it, it took them a bit of help to get there, and that's sort of the transition we're, we're hoping to have so that people do have the chance to become more successful than some of them currently are. Thank you. Councillor McLaren. Thank you. Did I hear you right that you were saying that people who are losing their supports and or reducing their supports um, will be, have to be dealt with by other services paid for by the city, such as the police and Correct. ambulance? May I ask about how much uh, more I do you think? I can't tell you the numbers. We, we also represent paramedics and we do have conversations with uh, other community agencies. Um, we do know that some paramedics have told me that when they go to the when they do have to go to the houses, they recognize that they're there less time, but they also recognize that the staff are intervening and doing the jobs that they're being hired to do, which is intervene and advocate for individuals and help them. Okay. And my second question, I've also heard from several constituents that claim that there's a closure of a vocational program that allowed um, your clients to find productive work training that would allow them to be productive in that community. I understand this is closing and uh, or yeah. is closed. Um, do you, how do you see this affecting the city? 
the vocational program has been great in assisting people with mental health or addictions concerns to um, obtain competitive employment jobs as any of us would go out and get and to be successful in that. That's a service that's a bit different than the other Kingston employment area agencies provide in that our agencies had specialized in the developmental delay or mental health and addictions part. So our other Kingston employment agencies would often refer clients with some more challenges to our agency. We had a more intensive program to help target that those client groups specifically. Again, the, the six success stories are wonderful. Um, without the vocational program, the, the challenge might be that some of the local Kingston areas will not be as, they may find it harder to serve the same clientele without referring them to our vocational team. Um, hopefully those people in the future are not deprived of job opportunities, that would be tragic. Um, but our, our agency, our vocational team has been quite successful in helping these people to reintegrate and find competitive employment and good jobs all yes. throughout Kingston. Deputy Mayor Hill. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, the program is, the rationale for the changes, is it, is it because of program efficiency, cost savings, a bit of both, or did they give you a rationale? Um, my understanding is that the investigation was launched because of uh, financial and, and, and some clinical issues. Okay. But financially, it was my understanding from reading the investigation report, that seemed to be the biggest driver. And the new model, the, uh, the, the new service delivery model, will it be able to accommodate as many uh, clients as you currently are serving? I'm not sure of that answer, quite frankly. I think that the service will look differently for all the reasons that we stated previously. We think that some of the decisions that are being made are counterintuitive to the needs of the clients. You know, there's a reason we separate out the different groupings is because they have specific needs that the staff in the house are, are trained to deal with them. If we put them all in the same pot, you're, interact you're interacting with them and I think it puts them at a higher risk of not having the same success. And is there a waiting list for your services? For some, yes. Yeah, okay, thank um, you. It was closed for housing some time ago, perhaps in foreshadowing this. Mm -hmm. to, to elaborate on your question, um, what will the change look like? Maybe some will be very good. Maybe some will yeah. be an enhancement. Um, change, change is change, right? It could be different. Um, the reason for us bringing this concern to, to your city is that some of these reductions, this cut to housing, is going to have follow-on impacts. It, it could not not have follow-on impacts for some time as these clients' needs remain. So yes, some agency changes may, may be great, mm -hmm. but by all means, they, they might be. Yeah. We're raising this yeah this as we, as we indicated every organization should be reviewed i'm sure as a, a council you review situations as well we do that we should all do that because that's how we learn from what we're doing we review we check to make sure something's working and that's the idea is by putting this to three to five years having the right people at the table and actually collaborating with them and seeing what the needs are we feel then that you can make a change a look at it, make adjustments, and then move forward. This is, you know, these are complex people, and as we said previously, you know, yes, some people may be very successful for all the changes, but some may not, and, and falling back is part of recovery. So we're, we're hopeful that uh, you will follow through with this and, and allow these people to have the time. Sorry, That's am I talking too much? Councilor Neal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just one quick question. Uh, three of us and a fourth recently, we've all sat on KFLNA Public Health. And I know there's been an expression of concern with the new uh, public health boundaries, which will go from Peterborough to Ottawa, and the, the loss of local decision-making and autonomy. Uh, what, what is the Lynn, how, how do you foresee the Lynn amalgamation affecting your uh, your operations, if at all? Quite frankly, I know that changes are coming. I have not read or seen the changes yet and what the new divisions will be. Okay. Guess, um, okay. Yes, is there anything else you want to add? No, okay. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so moving on to our next delegation this evening. Thank you. Uh, Anne Laheed will appear before council to speak with respect to report number 44, clause 3 from the CAO, 
respect to the North Kingstown strategic corridor analysis for the Wine Street extension. Good evening, everyone. My name is Anne Laheed. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Five years ago, ahead of the 2014 municipal election, we formed the group Wellington X because we wanted to amplify the considerable community opposition to the proposed Wellington Street extension, and we wanted to stop the road. After that election, we were confident that a majority on council opposed the road, or at least the southern section, because it would ruin a quiet waterfront park and create a barrier between the neighborhood and the river. So early in 2015, there was an attempt to draft a council motion that would cancel the Wellington Street extension, but we learned that it was not possible to wipe this road off the map with a single motion. At that time, we were told that revitalizing the inner harbor and achieving density targets for the area would be difficult without the extension, although it looks like the secondary plan will prove otherwise. And we were warned that the urban piece of the KMP Trail could not go ahead in advance of the road. Happily, that wasn't the case. As a consequence, a secondary planning process was set in motion, and finally the community opposition to the extension could be heard, recorded, and incorporated into a vision for North Kingstown. There has been a lot of public consultation, mostly organized by the city, and some by community, community groups such as ours, and it's been made very clear that the community does not want this road. We heard this again at the many public meetings for the 2015 Transportation Master Plan update and several drafts of the official plan. We appreciate that the consultants and our city planners have incorporated the input from residents into the vision for North Kingstown. Six years ago, this input was not so welcome, and the public meetings held to discuss proposed changes to Doug Fleur Park were tense. There was no opportunity to contemplate a park without the extension. And now in 2019, it's hard to imagine that a proposal for an arterial road through a park would be seriously considered. But back then, the wishes of people moving around within the neighborhood seemed to take a back seat to the desires of those moving through it in cars. Tonight, years later, Council can finally act to remove the Wellington Street extension south of Montreal and Rideau from the Transportation Plan for North Kingstown and from the update of the Development Charges Bylaw. By accepting staff's recommendation, this council can also remove the uncertainty that has long surrounded this corridor and Doug Floor Park. Traffic studies aside, there are more reasons now not to build the southern section than there were four years ago. As Kingston tries to cope with the increasing frequency of severe rainstorms, we need to think more about the permeability of surfaces, especially along waterways. Each year, more information is being collected about the wildlife sustained along this shoreline. As well, it is now more widely understood that adding roads just encourages more people to drive. And the modeling done by Dillon Consultants for this report actually predicts the induced demand that would happen if the WSE were to be built, either whole or in part. Wellington X will continue to watch and participate in the debate over the northern section of the WSE, which we also consider problematic. For one thing, it would compromise the KMP Trail. But for now, we will be very happy to see Council agree that the southern portion of the extension can be removed from the city's plans, and a downtown waterfront park, which provides necessary green space and supports significant wildlife, will continue to be tranquil, safe, and accessible. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the delegation? Yes, Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Mr. Lahid, for your uh, coming, speaking to us tonight. You summed up the history quite nicely in your five minutes, and uh, of course, we know was, there's a lot of emotional investment that people have made in your group and, and in the community. I, I, I agree with you about the southern section. I'm happy to see it. I, I wanted to focus more on what you said about the northern section. That's not what we're discussing tonight, but while you're here, um, uh, in what, what, what are you hearing in the community and in the group about what are, what are the fears about what it might do to the KMP Trail? Uh, well, currently the KMP Trail goes through green space in the old industrial area. It's a really nice 
uh, peaceful bike ride or, or hike. Um, and my understanding is that the northern section, if the northern section were to be built, then that trail would become a bike path on the side of, of an arterial. Less attractive. So is it fair to say that, 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 that the, your community group also opposes uh, that, that uh, eventuality should it be proposed? Um, yes, we've always stated our opposition is to the entire road. Um, we understand that um, the southern section has been the more controversial because, um, because of its effect on Doug Fleur Park and, um, and the waterways and so forth. So I think uh, the northern section's a little... Um, it's, it's going to be analyzed. There's an operational, operational analysis um, coming down the pipes for that and uh, lots of different things as well as traffic will be considered for that. Um, so we'll be watching that too. Thank you for your commitment. Thanks. Okay, seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Okay, uh, we have no other delegations this evening, so we will move on to briefings. We have one briefing, J.C. Kenny, Director of Communications and Customer Experience, will brief council respect to report number 44, Clause 5, Channel Management Strategy, Open Government Kingston Work Plan. Good evening, Mayor Patterson, members of council, those attending here tonight, and those watching on the live stream. My name is J.C. Kenny, Director of Communications and Customer Experience with the City of Kingston. I'm joined by Natalie Lacombe Elwood. She is the Manager of Customer Experience. A major focus in our portfolio is to champion collaboration with other city departments. As part of a shared process, we seek always to improve interactions with residents, students, visitors, with the goal of becoming a more responsive city that serves people in unparalleled fashion and where access to information and services is both consistent and convenient. So what does the channel management strategy mean the word channel refers to the various methods of interaction that we've all become accustomed to using in the 21st century. For our purposes, here this evening with the strategy, those channels are online, phone, and in person. This strategy is part of a vision, an evolution that began in 2015, and at that time, the city's strategic plan included a priority to foster open government. This called on the city to be transparent, accountable, more responsive, and to encourage participation among citizens. Mayor Patterson, councillors, as we move forward with this vision, our aim is to continually improve the customer experience. 20 years ago, it was normal to do our banking at a counter with a teller. We still do that, but many of us, for many of us now, we do the majority of our banking online, where the service is accessible where and when we need it. And as we head into the future, we know the demand for consistency and convenience will only increase. I'll hand things over now to my colleague, Natalie Lacan elwood Thank you very much. Thank you, JC. The channel management strategy forces staff to ask questions from the customer's perspective. How can the city make it easier for me to interact? What should it feel like to interact with the city? And what can I expect when I interact with the city online, over the phone, and at counters? So these are our guiding principles. Offer consistency of interaction, provide more services online that can be accessed when and where it is convenient, to expand the number of locations where services are offered, and use data more effectively in order to stay agile. As part of the vision uh, to be more responsive, city 
staff introduced a new customer relationship management or CRM system 11 months ago, joining the likes of Calgary, Waterloo, Brampton, and more. It is the centralized place for keeping customer information to serve them better. CRM has and continues to make it easier for staff to create service requests and report on progress. For instance, missed gar garbage collection or road maintenance. Currently, there are 11 departments integrated with CRM. And before moving uh, or adding more departments, staff is taking the opportunity to maximize functionality of the tools within the system. So counselors Osanic and Kylie, uh, when we last spoke uh, last month, uh, we talked about the importance of staff using tools consistently to ensure that staff or that customers are hearing back from us in a timely fashion. Staff continues to develop process to support the introduction of this new system. As well, work is underway to formalize service standards. This is specifically for departments that are not mandated to do so, so that service delivery is consistent. The customer relationship, uh, sorry, the customer uh, portal, uh, Kingston, mykingston.ca, will be the public facing side of CRM. It is a development, it's in development, and will increase access to online services through self-serve forms. Uh, one of the forms that uh, the city piloted um, last year was in partnership with uh, Kingston Transit. And this, uh, it was a lost and found form, and it made it a lot easier to match lost items with their owners. Um, a recent example was a customer was able to uh, get their wallet back in 16 minutes. So instead of, you know, hours or days. So quite remarkable. The portal will also include a library of how-to articles, for instance, how to pay a parking ticket or where to buy baggage tags, bag tags. As well, the portal provides a mechanism for customer feedback to measure satisfaction and identify opportunities for improvement and efficiency in service delivery. Single sign-on. This is how customers will access the portal. So in the future, using one username and password, you'll be able to create a dashboard to access, get involved, play, track progress on service requests, access information from, all, uh, from one centralized location, and this integration will grow over time. With the increasing number of visits to our website, we can all agree that there's opportunity to make the site more user friendly. The city is updating the existing infrastructure and maximizing the existing platform to support changing business needs. So the work to be started by the end of this year will involve a strategy for updating and archiving content, display information more dynamically, and offer increased analytics for departments. We know social media is an increasing, increasingly more convenient way of interacting. Staff will work to leverage analytics to better understand how customers consume content. So taking climate action, for example, a, a staff may use Twitter for, to share statistics, Facebook to share more detailed information, and Instagram to post a video interview. In short, using platforms more strategically to tell the story from different angles. Another important component of the strategy is to be more, uh, to be more responsive through our phone system. The goal is to upgrade the system to field calls more effectively and efficiently through clear and concise daytime and after hours messaging in order to meet the changing needs of our diverse community. We want to make it uh, simple uh, or simplify the uh, phone experience by reducing the number of phone numbers associated with the city, while also recognizing that there will be some business units like Rideau Crest and Fire and Rescue that will need to maintain their own phone number for operational needs. We will expand the number of locations where customers can conveniently access services in person. The proposed locations referred to as customer service hubs are identified on this slide and are intended to complement the existing menu of services available at City Hall. Service hubs will increase the city's ability to offer service outside of traditional business hours. Services will be introduced over time in a phased approach, so offering services where there is demand. 
And this process will begin at the end of this month using an informal survey for staff at Artillery Park in Vista and Rideau Heights to capture the type of interaction, the channel, and location. This map illustrates uh, the initial service area with two of the proposed locations in close proximity of the 401. In more rural areas, uh, Councillor Oosterhoff and uh, Bowen, who's not here, um, you'll recall that staff completed an early study looking at opportunities for increasing interactions with those residents. So what you're seeing here is really just the beginning. This is a snapshot of our menu of services. So down the left-hand side are the services and across the top are the locations, City Hall, the service hubs, as well as online. So we've marked the existing services and the services to be introduced over time. So in conclusion, the channel management strategy ensures that services are delivered via the channels that are most effective for the customer, but also the most efficient for uh, the city to ensure that we have consistent customer experience online, over the phone, and at counters. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from Council? Councilor Shroud. Thank you. Just a, a small question about the new service uh, hubs, I guess you called them. Uh, so the Invista will have like a counter similar to the, the here in City Hall where you can, you can access services. Uh, the slide was only up for a minute about which services that would be, but is that part of, of the Invista there? I, I know the Invista has offices and they have their services there already, but I'm wondering is, there, is this going to be an addition or what's going to be different? How's it going to be, look? Through you, Mayor Patterson. Um, so yes, yeah, so um, at the existing services, and this is a model that has been used in other municipalities, um, that they leverage existing resources at rec facilities. So they already have expanded hours. There's already people at counters. So offering, um, increasing the ability to offer service outside of those hours. So the um, services that are at Invista will continue, but we're looking to layer in more where it makes sense. So the, the service counter at the entrance will basically have, will be staffed with more staff than currently and there will be more services available? Is that what's going to happen? So same friendly service. Um, so what we're looking at and we're working in collaboration with um, the rec uh, facility group um, to ensure that we have uh, proper resourcing. Thank you. Um, so just to, through you, Mr. Mayor, to add to that, um, we already have staff in place that are, um, that are there providing service. And there are different times of the day where things get busier, but there are definitely times of the day where things are quieter. So it's about looking at how we can introduce more customer frontline services, utilizing the resources we already have in place. That's the first step that we're going to be looking at. Councillor Sinek. Thank you, Your Worship, and thanks very much for this presentation. I was interested in the parts where you said um, that there will be opportunity to leverage the data, improve the analytics, and I just wondered um, if some of those reports could be shared to Council. Um, it'd be really interesting, I think, like for all of 2018, or maybe we have to start this year in 2019, what's the number one, you know, um, request that's come either online or over, you know, 5460000, you know, was it request for um, garbage pickup because garbage was missed, or is it potholes, like, what, what are the, that top 10 lists that I don't think we've ever received before and I think it'd be really interesting for council to get and um, I just wanted to make sure that that data would be able to be collected and shared with us with this new system. So we could definitely share um, top five services, like that type of thing, high level. Um, so yes, that is possible. Um, off the top, uh, general reception, parking, garbage and recycling, taxation, those are the top, within the top five. You're welcome. Councillor Ostroff. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Thanks for your presentation. I've been waiting for it for a while. It's good, really good to 
crack it open and expose it and see what you're doing. And uh, I really appreciate the, the challenge that you have and uh, and for, for considering the challenge, like you said, it's just the beginning for the rural areas. And um, I'm sure um, Ryan and I, uh, Councillor Bohm and I both have those challenges. And I'm wondering if you have, um, if you've consulted with other uh, municipalities with large rural areas, and do we have some best practices to work with? And um, have we can we build on that or uh, utilize that or sample them for us? Uh, through, Who would like to say that? Yeah. Me, through you, Mayor Patterson. Um, we definitely uh, see opportunity for working with other municipalities. Customer experience um, is you know still new in terms of public sector and how we look at um, how we still deliver service. So, um, you know, sharing experience with other municipalities and other colleagues um, is definitely something that's part of our uh, our work. I didn't see a hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, just to add to that, one of the municipality that we've been working with um, is uh, the City of Ottawa. And as you know, the City of Ottawa has a significant rural area as well. So we are going to be looking at some best practices in terms of how they're able to, uh, to provide customer service in their rural area. Deputy Mayor Hill. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Uh, I've had a lot of, uh, of uh, very pleasant uh, feedback from folks, particularly around the Contact Us uh, and, the, and the response of staff back uh, uh, th through that portal. So it's been wonderful, you know, and, and I know it's growing as you proceed. So congratulations to you on that. The one area of concern that gets expressed to me, though, is uh, how do people make that, those contacts in the kind of off hours for pressing issues or emergency issues? They seem to be at a loss for... Uh, you know, how to reach out and, and make the necessary contacts at a kind of awkward time during the day or weekends or long weekends, that sort of thing. Sure. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hill, and through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. We recognize that the off hours are difficult, but one thing that we've been doing, and we certainly based on your comment and others, we are speaking more to people through social media. So it isn't always ideal for everybody on social, but we certainly are trying to be available as much as we can uh, on those off hours. For instance, recent um, concerns about flooding. We weren't sure whether we were going to have any, but we made sure that we kept everybody in the loop and we had uh, ways that we got out on our social media as to how we could be in touch over weekends and, you know, overnight as well. So we're getting better at that and we're really trying to be available. And I think uh, based on your comment, we'll look for more ways of doing, of doing that very thing because we recognize too, it's all about consistency and convenience, and we want to be available. Thank Acting, you. Acting CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So a couple of, of comments that uh, I can add. One is um, by working with the service um, hubs as well, and if you see the operating hours, they're actually operating during weekends currently and evenings as well. So by ensuring that those employees are properly trained and have information available, they'll be able to respond as well after what we would consider more of the office hours. So that will provide that additional support during weekend and up until about nine o'clock during weekdays. The other thing is we also have an after hour um, line uh, that can be contacted. So these are all gonna be streamlined to make sure that we can work with the services we have in place and for anything that's later at nine o'clock when we actually do not have uh, staff that are in those service hubs, then that would be referred to, uh, to a, a separate uh, line. Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm curious about, JC, at the beginning you mentioned uh, working with all the departments and sort of the, the rollout of the CRM and related um, work here. I'm curious about the so j let's just say i'm sure this happens a lot here's a scenario happens for sure for counselors we receive either by email or we run into someone on the street and they have not just one concern they have a number of concerns and so then um, might put all that information into one email and send it along or we might break it up however we we currently do that if that if in, in a case like that if the um 
if through Contact Us, for example, there was an email that had a whole number of concerns. Um, how do you foresee kind of doing that differently or better through the channel system, through, through all the integration that's happening with the various departments? Through you, Mayor Patterson. Um, so in terms of uh, when you send an email to contact us, that automatically generates a service request. So going forward, um, that's definitely something that we would encourage that each, um, each interaction uh, it, with the ability um, to follow up when we do introduce the customer uh, portal. So having that unique uh, service request number will be will make it more efficient to track uh, to track service. It's also very helpful if you're calling um, if you're calling in to you know sort of follow up and kind of see what's going on to have that service request number. So we encourage that um, each service request has a unique number just for easy uh, follow up. Right. Okay. So, so if then, um, let, just I'm trying to understand what's happening behind the scenes. So, say someone says there's this property. It, um, my neighbor, you know, they're not, they're not keeping the property up. Uh, there's some animal control issues. Uh, there seems to be a, a parking on the street or on the lawn thing happening. And so, it's just a kind of a whole bunch of complaints about, let's say, one property. So, within. Currently, if we send something like that along, does it get broken down and kind of different or, uh, numbers attached and then put back together with one response? Or is that something, how do we, how do we handle that currently and how might we do that in the future? Through you, Mayor Patterson. Um, so behind the scenes, service requests are transferred and assigned to each other. So um, it comes into the contact center. Um, the customer service rep, um, you know, looks at it and categorizes it accordingly. Um, and if it's a service request that uh, requires more than one department to look at it, um, it can be uh, or is uh, assigned to a different department. Um, so often, um, if it's something that requires more than one um, uh, supervisor, let's say, to look at it. Um, just in between departments, someone might email, like you email a colleague to say, this is the service request number. Um, we're currently working on it, but um, you know, uh, people, more than one person can access the service request. Thanks. That, that's helpful. I was kind of. I was wondering if that's. It seems like that's how it happens through email. But I was just more curious about whether with this with the CRM, if there's any kind of like live tracking of requests that can happen through. Just I'm just trying to understand like how staff manage as far as like is there a way to improve um, the ability to look and see what's happening, like other. To, Say with Google Docs, for example, you know, someone makes an update and you see that change live in the cloud and all that. Um, is that happening? Will that be happening or is there any need for that to happen? Like, I think the email thing seems to work. It just seems like it's a lot of time and back and forth and energy. <laughs> so there is a um, tracking log. Um, so, yes. Thank you. Councillor Neal. Thank you very much. A um, couple of questions. I'm sorry, did you have a follow-up? No? Sorry, okay. yes, Ms. Kidd. Through you, Your Worship, uh, just to add uh, to the answer that was provided, um, the, uh, as, uh, as Natalie explained, each time you touch a work order, you can make an entry and indicate that you've spoken or what you've done or some action that you've taken, so it's regularly updated. But to your, to your question, Councillor Holland, I think there's always the reality that whether something comes in through Contact Us and it's created as a service order or if it just comes as an email, there are times when there are so many things bundled into it that you need to pick the phone up and call the person, <laughs> sort through those things, and... Uh, Prioritize because sometimes, um, sometimes if you can solve two or three things, the whole bunch of little things kind of solve themselves. So um, that at, that philosophy hasn't gone away, and we've been practicing that, and we will continue to practice that. Councilor Neal, thank you. Um, the I'm going to follow up on Councilor Hill's comments about after hours. Um, I know that we now have on weekends, uh, bylaw enforcement office 
officer on duty, and it's sometimes problematic, uh, even for counselors, uh, to be able to reach out when there's a legitimate complaint from a constituent. And if there's some way of addressing that, whether it's a single phone that bylaw officers own with a phone number that can be communicated and so you could reach them. Um, typically, when I get such a complaint, I end up emailing a manager or a commissioner who surprisingly always respond quickly, <laughs> but that it is problematic if there's some way to address that. I can see a hurdle. Thank you, and, and through Mr. Mayor. So that is definitely one of the challenge in terms of after hours and having different phone numbers for, for different services. And it can be confusing for members of the public, members of council, and, and even sometimes for staff. So that is going to be part of what we're going to review. And, and I think the report talks about the number of phone numbers we currently have in extension, it, it's unbelievable. Um, and it's impossible to remember all of them. So we're gonna be working on streamlining those and hopefully creating a, a one number access so that then whatever the request is, it can be dispatched appropriately, but it shouldn't be up to the member of council or member of public to try to figure out what number they have to call for, for which service. And my second comment, or question, um, and I know it's improved, but the most frequent complaint I get, and I'm sure some of my colleagues get, is from a constituent who's done, called the city, been acknowledged uh, with their complaint, but two, three days later, they haven't heard back. And I know you're doing a better job of that than you were two or three years ago, but that's still the most frequent complaint that I receive. Thank you, Councillor Neal, and through you, um, Your Worship, we are, I, I, I do want to say that we are improving in all these areas. I appreciate you pointing that out. Um, what we're doing with the channel management strategy is definitely a vision, and it's definitely where we're going. We want to be able to through the CRM, through the customer relationship management tool, we do want to be able to, and we, we, we are working on being able to respond within 48 hours. But we're 11 months in, and we're still finding things that we need better process with, to be quite frank. And we're, we're almost there. But that is when we met with uh, Councillors Osanic and uh, Kylie a few weeks ago, they had some questions about that very thing, Councillor Neal. And what we said is, we're close, um, and we want to be able to respond, and so that the resident person, whomever, knows that their service request, that their issue has been uh, answered, acknowledged. Sometimes it'll be a while before it's fixed, but at least acknowledged. And so, so that is part of where we're going. We're just, we're, we're, we're not quite there yet, but we will continue on the road to improvement. Thank you. I appreciate that. And finally, um, last fall there was a motion that council passed for a good neighbor guide. And I'm just curious where we might be at in that process. It was fall of last year. Just wondering is that who, who the person... Councilor Neal, is that related to the general I think it's related strategy? to. I think it's related to uh, communication. So we're not having a briefing, though, on communications as a whole. We're having a briefing with okay. respect to the channel. Whoever has the answer strategy. to that, I would appreciate receiving For sure. it. If we can Councilor Neal, we can get back to you on that. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Chappelle. Thank you, through your worship, that's great. Um, I like the idea of having a CRM model. I, I, using it in the corporate world, it makes a lot of sense into uh, having feedback to the client, the client being our constituents. One of the items you had mentioned that twigged uh, attention to my experience was the idea that you were looking at uh, shaping some of the improvements with the services that you're currently using in the 11 departments, I think you said. 
Has there been any consideration of using GIS to map out the addresses of where the, the calls are coming in so you could do heat maps later on on density of where complaints are coming from? Not necessarily complaints, but concerns from our constituents are coming from so that maybe we can address those in an expedited fashion if there's a, a, a significant amount of, of activity coming from an intersection, uh, Centennial and, and, and perhaps um, Gardner's Road of red lights being run and things like that, that we're able to then respond to it faster? We, we have a system in place already. I'm going to let Natalie uh, address that, Councillor Chappelle. So we do have that functionality. Um, and right now from um, the customer uh, service side of things, um, we do use that technology. We have a strong partnership with the Information Systems and Technology Department um, for integration. Uh, applications further down the road like My Neighborhood and uh, Open Data uh, Kingston will also be integrated with CRM. So we are moving in that direction. Councillor Doherty. Thank you and through you. Um, thank you for your presentation. That was really interesting. And I think it's fantastic that uh, we're opening up more community hubs, so getting out into the community. Um, my question is around more also the focus on open government and how to reach people in our community who don't have access to computers. And if you're thinking maybe of working with the library and some community organizations like the Senior Center and perhaps have some designated city computers where they can then access the Get Involved Kingston. That's basically to, how to reach out to the community because I know you're doing a lot of great work, but it, the challenge is, is getting it out to the community. Thank you, Councillor Doherty. And uh, through you, uh, Your Worship, we, you know, in case we've left you with the impression that this is all to do with online, it absolutely is not. We are still going to the bank teller. Many people still do that, and many people are not online. So we're very acutely aware of that. And in the communications department, one of the things we're doing is trying to get out to some of these community organizations and find out what their needs are. We've already started doing that. It's a bit of a slow process because there's there's a lot to do. But um, the other thing that we're, we're finding is that um, people have, when we go out and we talk to them, they have feedback just like that. So we want to be able to... Uh, deal with people, we mentioned the rural areas as well, and, and, and Councillor Oosterhoff is aware that we're attending uh, the rural advisory uh, committee meetings more often. Again, to try and find out how do people interact? How are they? Uh, they're not necessarily on Twitter or on Facebook, so how, are, how can we best interact? We do not have all the answers yet, but I can say that we're we're we're, we're inching closer to to getting at the answer that that to getting at that question that you've asked. Um, how do we better communicate with people? And often, quite frankly, we pick up the phone. We do. We just pick up the phone because you might have somebody who's got an issue uh, with with a pothole, with something something that's really getting under their skin, and an email. Uh, a Facebook message, even a private message, it's not going to do it. We just pick up the phone and talk to them. Thank you for your question. Okay. Seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, moving on in our agenda, uh, we have no other briefings. Are there any petitions to present? Seeing none, we have no motions of congratulations, recognition, sympathy, condolences, and speedy recovery. We have no deferred motions. So we will move to reports. First up, we have report number 43 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Hutchison, that report number 43 from the Chief Administrative Officer, consent, be received and adopted. So there are seven clauses. Would anyone like any of those clauses separated? Councillor Sanek? Uh, report four and seven, please. Number four. Number seven, Councillor Stroud? Number six, please. Number six. Councillor Kiley? Number two. Number two. Okay, so we will first uh, vote on the balance of the clauses. So, first we have clause one lease renewal, 1425 Midland Avenue, Department of National Defense. Clause three minor bylaw revision for posted speed limits at various locations. 
And clause five, a word of contract, 2019 model 11 foot rotary rough mower. We'll call the vote, please. And that carries. Clause two, Universal Transit Pass Agreement, St. Lawrence College. Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. My question was about the, the cost per eligible student. I'm wondering if those numbers are the same that are used for the agreement with Queen's University. This is for St. Lawrence, wondering if that's the same uh, number for the Queen's agreement. Commissioner Kidd. Through you, Your Worship. Um, actually, no, they're not. Uh, St. Lawrence uh, pays a higher rate per student, and that is based on the actual usage um, of St. Lawrence students compared to Queen students, and it's also based on the overall number of students that pay under the universal agreement. Okay, thank you. Okay, we will call the vote on Clause 2. That carries. Clause four, a word of contract, pavement markings. Councillor Sanic. Thank you, Your Worship. When I first read the report, I thought, okay, my first question is going to be, what's the warranty on our line painting? Because on Bath Road, we saw some lines wear off over the winter, and it's like there's got to be a better way, you know, to guarantee line painting for at least two years. But after talking to our director of public works today, Bill Lennon, he was telling me um, that the line painting is actually specified by the Ministry of Transportation, and I just wondered if Commissioner Kidd could describe that in more detail, because it was news to me, for sure. Commissioner Kidd? Through you, Your Worship. Um, I also had a, a, a lesson in line painting this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> So I will do my very best. Uh, uh, Mr. Lennon has explained that uh, all Canadian municipalities uh, face the same challenge. So yes, the, uh, uh, a few years ago, the, um, the ministry uh, regulated the type of paint and the way the paint would be applied, would be, would be applied. And so we used to use an oil-based paint, which had a much longer life. And now the uh, paint that is used for line painting is more environmentally friendly, more equivalent to like a water-based paint. It does not, uh, it, it, it seldom lasts a season. It is subject to wear and tear, weather conditions, uh, and all of those things, and has to be reapplied each year. In some cases, uh, some municipalities uh, actually apply portions of it uh, twice in, in one season. Thank you very much, and Elise Bath Road has been repainted last week. It looks much better. Thank you. Okay, we'll call the vote on Clause 4, please. And that carries. Clause 6, 2019 Special Occasion Permit Requests. Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship. I have a couple questions to staff. Um, I read the report. Uh, the first one, so I see that uh, so Arts Fest is coming back this year. Uh, it's a very big event, and there's a, uh, a portion. This, this recommendation is about the, the permit for the alcohol. Um, I'm wondering if during this permit process there was an opportunity to address the presence of many large heavy vehicles on the grass in the park which was one of the community concerns or is that uh, would that be addressed in a different way through the special events policy and i guess i'm just looking for more information on what we can do to sort of preserve the 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 grass the turf which gets uh, uh, cut up with ruts every year mr kimboss thank you and see you uh, yes, with the new uh, revised special event policy uh, that council recently approved, uh, parking and uh, facility vehicles is all part of a, of a new uh, requirement for a parking plan and uh, re regarding logistics and repairs as necessary. So um, that type of damage will, will look to be prevented wherever possible um, and look to be uh, fixed if uh, if it's uh, uh, not possible to, to completely prevent. Um, also with the new policy, the uh, resting periods that are required in between events will also assist with rehabilitation from just the sheer number of people regardless of, of heavy vehicles. So um, those are the improvements that the council has recently uh, recently received and approved. 
Okay. My second question is about, is about something else, but just as a follow-up on what you said about the resting period, so does that mean that some events will have to rotate, or like the Arts Fest, or is, is that for other events, or, or for extra events in a, in a place that's had multiple events in the same year? Uh, no, that shouldn't be the case. Uh, there are uh, special exemptions for, for certain events, and, and such as one of these with uh, Rib Fest, as I believe it's very close in proximity to the Fall Fair, um, and other events at the Municipal, uh, municipal uh, sorry, Memorial Center grounds. So no, with this uh, direction tonight, it's just to uh, approve the, uh, the alcohol uh, permitting. Um, and as far as these events, they, they fit within the, the terms of the policy for resting. Okay, the second question, uh, it, it involved the description of the two events and the difference in how they approach the containers people drink from. So in Rib Fest, you get a commemorative glass. It's explained in the report. I don't know if you guys saw this. Uh, you get a commemorative glass. It's a great idea. It's a souvenir, but also it's the glass that you use because it's you. You can, you can drink your own glass, multiple different drinks from the same glass. Uh, so that's a sustainable practice. Uh, and it's self-evident. So it, it, is there anything in the special events policy that could com compel other large events, or especially for alcohol, such as the Art Fest, of requiring the same reusable containers? Uh, yes, for you, that's, uh, that's a great point. And, and the, the report does note that the, uh, the Arts Fest is able to have that reusable uh, glassware, which is actually not accepted in the current policy. So what uh, we want to look at is uh, changes, uh, per potential changes to bring to council for those policies. Uh, but right now, the, the current policy for uh, the alcohol and events allows either paper or plastic cups. Now, there are provisions to make sure they properly uh, uh, clean up all the uh, all the cups, um, but we staff are bringing back a report to council on uh, on single use plastics, and and one of the things we want to to look at there and have been looking at is how can we adjust our policies uh, to reflect the the need to reduce and eliminate single use plastics, and what can we do as a municipality ourselves as leaders in that in order to to require others to to follow suit. Thank you. I think I just think it's a, a real opportunity here because we have a great example being. Uh, shown to us by Ribfest, and that template can be applied to any event, really. So, uh, and we already ban plastic bottles in our vending machines and single-use plastic, right? So, I, I would love to see that in the special events policy when it comes back. But I guess now, that for the purposes of these permits, we don't have a choice. I know that there are thousands of uh, plastic cups used every Arts Fest, and I, and I definitely think there's some improvement there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sinek. Thank you. Uh, following on with that, um, notwithstanding the future report on single-use plastic, but for today, or like last year when we had Art Fest and when we had Rib Fest, how does recycling work? Do we provide as a city um, unlimited blue boxes for you know plastic cups and whatnot, or do, do the organizers have to request that, and do they have to pay extra to have recycling? Because I know in the past sometimes we've had complaints that there hasn't been enough recycling available. Mr. Hugo Boss? Yeah, thank you, and through you. Um, I would need to get back to you on specific details. Uh, definitely with the permit, they are required to provide um, uh, a full cleanup and, and that what services that the city provides, uh, I can't tell you directly, um, but I definitely can get back to you on that. Um, we do think it's um, important that they have, we have those options for the, for the event goers. Um, uh, but unfortunately, I, I'm sorry, I can't answer that tonight. And I, and I don't think I have someone here that, that could. Okay, so we will call the vote on Clause 6. Please vote. And that carries. Clause 7, Terms of Reference, Heritage Kingston Review Working Group. Uh, who separated this? Councillor Sanek. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So, um... <laughs> For the, I was looking at the terms of reference, and I just have a question about the terms of reference, like for the mandate of this working group. Um, we know that Heritage Kingston used to be separate from the cultural, um, you know, committee, and then they were merged together. And I just wonder when they bring together this working group to review, you know, it's what been three years that we've had Heritage Kingston now as one merged committee. Would, is part of the mandate 
to actually look at if it should be separated again, for heritage versus culture, or is that not going to be part of the mandate? Ms. Agnew? Thank you, and through you. So the, the report that's before you and the approach that's being taken is, is really being driven based on the original wording of the motion that came forward through council. So it's looking at Heritage Kingston in its current structure, which enjo enjoys a cultural and built heritage mandate. And from a staff perspective, we're not suggesting a structural change of that nature to separate. We're looking at the, the functioning of the committee in its current structure how the procedures are going and having an update um, that evaluates how things are going from a process perspective since the time that the committee came together under one mandate. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll call the vote on clause seven, please. And that carries by a vote of 11 to 1. Okay, on to report number 44 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Osanek and seconded by Councillor Chappelle that report number 44 from the Chief Administrative Officer recommend be received and adopted clause by clause. Okay, so first up we have clause 1, operational plans for the Kingston and Cana drinking water systems, drinking water quality management systems. We'll call the vote please. And that carries. Clause two, addition to drinking water system financial plan. Please vote. And that carries. Clause three, North Kingstown strategic corridor analysis for the Wellington Street extension. Councilor Hutchison. Thank you, Worship. <clears throat> I just wanted to say how um, Happy I am to see this uh, initiative. It's been going on for years. As was said, but I can't put the, the whole story together as neatly as the, uh, the delegation, which gave you a historical idea of how long it had gone on and how many hundreds of people were involved in this. However, once, um, once it was decided and, and, and those folks were successful in getting council to save the park and um, look at the, um, well, the whole North Kingstown secondary plan, which is way more than I was looking for when I tried to cancel the WSC one night. But it's actually really good for the district, so I've not had any objections to that. And now we're going to do it in the right and uh, technically correct way. So that's, that's, that's good as well. Um, so I want to thank those uh, citizens who did a lot of work, a lot of research, a lot of organizing. But I also want to thank staff that once the council made its intentions clear, they have carried out the work uh, with a blom, you know, with really done well, really kept us informed, and have made it clear all the way along what the intention was and how it would work out, and here it is. The southern part of the WSC will be canceled. The park will be saved, uh, hopefully enhanced at some point, but one step at a time. And um, the KMB Trail did go through, so, um, and, um, so a lot of good things have happened from that, and thanks to the, the work of many, many people. Thank you. Councillor Stroud. Thank you. I have a question for staff for clarification. I think I know the answer, but I think maybe members of the public may be unclear about this. It has to relate, it relates to the north section. So with the, with the changes that are mentioned here to the transportation master plan that essentially eliminate the southern section from our plans once and for all, and the reason for all of the jubilation in that neighborhood, uh, for the north section, though, is that something that is dependent on the secondary plan's implementation, 
uh, and what happens to the transportation master plan with the northern section. And I'm just wondering whether what we're passing here tonight has any bearing on the northern section, or is that still pending? Mr. Simple. Uh, through your worship, uh, thank you for the, the question, Councillor Stroud. So um, the the report that's um, before you tonight um, is has been brought right now in relation to some information that's required for the development the development charges bylaw update. Um, the North Kingstown secondary plan and the associated transportation plan is still underway, and this is a technical component that will feed into that. Um, that transportation plan. The, the, the technical um, analysis shows that there is a, there is a benefit to, to a northern, um, um, some northern capacity, sort of north of Railway Street. But that is work that is ongoing. Um, the next step as part of this analysis is what we call an operational analysis. And that's where we'll be looking at, at some of those specific details of what that would look like and how that would appear. All of those details would then form part of the transportation plan, the more fulsome transportation plan for North Kingstown as, as a planning area and the secondary plan. With the conclusions of that study, those, those conclusions would then drive um, future changes to other policy documents. Um, including um, updates to the transportation master plan and future updates um, to financial plans, development charges, and um, and the official plan and and other associated documents. Thank you. That that's what I thought. So basically, there is some. Uh, it, it's legitimate if you're a an active transportation person and you walk or cycle on the KMB trail as it is today, and you note the. Uh, the beauty of uh, having a pathway just for your mode. Uh, you're sharing it with other active modes, but you're not sharing it with cars. And it's that separation from the uh, the car infrastructure that makes the KMP Trail so successful. Uh, that point, like, and, and it, the urban section of the KMP, the best sections are the ones that are separate from uh, from any roadway. Uh, most of the sections are like that. There are times when you have to cross. Um, I was just wondering whether that simple fact that, that the separation from car infrastructure is what makes the KMP so desirable for active transportation, whether that simple fact is already quantified in the work that's ongoing on, in the secondary plan and the uh, the update to the transportation plan. Mr. Semple? Uh, through your worship. Uh, so I, I can't speak to the specific, the, the quantification of, of the, the facility or the location of the trail. But what I can say is there are, the, the North Kingstown transportation plan considers a variety of factors in looking at um, at the tr at the transportation network that needs to be created for the city and the transportation network that meets the desires of the members of the North Kingstown community. The discussion of uh, non-auto modes, in particular active transportation and and transit, is a is a, a large component of the analysis that's done in this future stage in the operational analysis aspect. The technical study that we're looking at tonight was looking at at vehicle capacity through through those neighborhoods and across some sections of that neighborhood. Uh, the details of what those facilities would look like, uh, the details of what intersections and pathway connections and transit service levels, that is part of that next step of work that we're looking at. Okay, so I get from your answer that we'll have to bring it up again at the next step, and that I will do that. Thank you. Councillor Neal. Thank you. Um, I too would like to thank the community for working so hard on this and staff for, for this report coming forward. Um, for almost 20 years, this has been a very, very community divisive issue. Uh, my former colleague, Donnie Bristol, uh, led the good fight in the 80s and 90s against uh, this, and 
here we are almost 30 years later uh, still debating it. And I, I think it truly is time to put a stake in the heart of the Wellington Street extension because I think it, particularly given our our commitment to active transportation and our commitment to uh, trying to affect climate change by reducing traffic, that this is a, a step towards that goal. So uh, I look forward to this passing tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Holland. Thank you, Worship. Um, I'm. I have a question for staff. I had a conversation today with a neighbor who um, drew my attention to a global news poll that was conducted recently on the two sections of the of the road, um, looking for input. And I know that there was considerable input over many, many years, as, as my colleagues have mentioned, uh, in different contexts, more recently in the North Kingstown Secondary Plan discussion. So I'm just curious if we, uh, if, if um, we could just get a bit of a summary for the public on the overall level of engagement support uh, discussion on this issue, just very high level, obviously, as it's been a while. Who would like to take that? Mr. Newman. Through you, Mayor Patterson. So over the course of the past year and a half, there's been a lot of discussions about the Wellington Street extension with uh, members of the community as well as some of the business owners that actually uh, operate their business within the old industrial area specifically. So the vocal majority of people that we've engaged in the discussion um, have been opposed to the, to the road, both the north and the south half. Um, however, when talking with business owners in the old industrial area, there were a number that said that it, they, th they felt it would provide benefit to being able to get into and out of the, the actual uh, business park. So uh, vocal majority of the people we've engaged in the process have been opposed, uh, but there are some who feel it will have benefit for their businesses. Deputy Mayor, will you take the chair? I take the chair and recognize you. Thank you. Um, when this issue first hit the radar for me, it seemed pretty clear that there was a trade-off. On the one hand, there was the potential to revitalize and redevelop the North Kingstown area. At the same time, there was also the need to preserve the existing green space. And certainly the vast majority of people I've spoken to talked about the need to preserve Doug Fleur Park. Certainly, I think uh, I've made it clear that my views have evolved on this issue because it seemed clear to me that there was a way that we could accomplish two goals at the same time. And that was to come up with an alternative road network that would allow for that revitalization and redevelopment and preserve the existing green space at the same time. So I am very happy to support the recommendation that is in front of us because we are building a road, it's just a different one. And it's not a road through the park. It's going to be a road network that will allow for the redevelopment that we need. The northern section, I think it's clear that as much as we need to talk about the transportation element, we need to talk about exactly what Mr. Newman just raised with us, and that is the importance of road access to be able to create an old industrial area that can be a home for new businesses that will be uh, available for shops and commercial space. And the fact is that road access is really important for new businesses to be able to thrive in that area. So I know that there's still lots of work and lots of discussion to happen, but I think that there is still uh, an importance to talk about what that road network could look like. The only thing I would say is if we do move ahead with it, we would not call it Wellington Street. It would be something else to make it very clear that we'll never connect to the existing Wellington Street we have in the downtown. So I'm happy to support this, but I think, again, we need to make sure we keep that big picture view when it comes to achieving all the goals we have as council, not only to preserve existing green space, but also to see what else we can do to revitalize that area of the city. Thank you very much. And I return the chair. Thank you. So seeing nobody else on my speakers list, we will call the vote on Clause 3, please. And that carries. Clause 4, Interim Control Bylaw and Land Use Planning Study within the Williamsville Main Street Corridor. We'll call the vote, please.
And that carries by a vote of 11 to 1. Clause 5, Channel Management Strategy, Open Government, Kingston Work Plan. We'll call the vote, please. And that carries. Clause 6, Fundraising Campaign, Residential Hospice, Kingston. Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship. I have a couple questions for staff. Uh, I know we heard from uh, representatives of hospice a few weeks ago, and uh, I don't think anyone doubts the the worthiness of the cause, but it's the way that it the, the, that it takes shape when we actually see it on the paper. So this is a um, a way to try to waive the fees and charges that would normally be levied. Uh, for the development uh, of about a half a million dollars, as you can see in the recommendation, uh, reimbursed 100000 over five years from the uh, operating budget. And as we know, the operating budget has nothing to do with building a new hospice. So I was going to ask staff why it has to be in this form. Why, is, why does the financing have to, be, have to come out of the operating budget? Ms. Kennedy. Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. So the city does not have the ability to waive the development fees. They, particularly the development charges and post fees, have to be paid into those funds. Um, and so in that regard, we would do that through the operating fund. No different than when we have exemptions, industrial exemptions for our development fees, and we pay those over time with, with increased assessment back into those funds. So it's the same type of thing and, and appropriate to go through the operating budget for that. So could you give us an example of something that we recently approved uh, where there was a waiver of fees for a different development and it came from the operating budget? Uh, Acting CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So I, I'm not sure that it is recent, but uh, one example that I can recall would have been the um, contribution to the expansion of the YMCA on uh, Wright Crescent when they actually added their one of their pools. Um, the city did make a contribution, and it was, again, through development charges, and it was paid back over time uh, the same way that we're proposing to do tonight. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have another question here. Just wait one minute. Um, so, so just to confirm then, I mean, this is, seems to be the way that it's done according to the treasurer. So there is no way to fund this uh, from, ca from our capital budget, even though it's a capital expense. Ms. Kennedy? Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. That's correct. There, there's no source that we would have through capital. It would not be applicable with our capital policies. Okay. And I guess we've, we've heard, we've, the precedent's already been set because with YMCA we did uh, something similar uh, and this is the only way we can do it. I, I guess the question to staff would then be, is it accurate that this is a waiver of fees and charges? Uh, is that the way it should be described or is it more accurately that we are devoting part of our operating budget to supporting worthy causes? Ms. Kennedy? Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I think the, the reason that we went that way is we had to set some threshold on how we were doing it. I would look at it that this is a contribution um, to a community initiative, but the way that we framed that or the way we define what that contribution is in terms of a threshold of amount is for the development fee. So, so it's, it's just how we define that actual contribution. And normally a contribution of any kind like that, just like we would contribute to an agency, would then be through the operating budget. Okay, one more question. So this is about the future. Uh, so, uh, so, so say this passes and we, we uh, contribute this amount to help them reach their fundraising goal and get their project finished. Do, is there anything from communication with hospice that would indicate that they may uh, come back in the future with operating fund requests for operations? I can say a hurdle. Thank you, and through Mr. Mayor, so in in my discussion or conversation with Auspice Kingston, their request is specifically to actually help their fundraising campaign. Uh, there has been no request nor conversation about ongoing funding or operational funding. Okay, so the logical final follow-up would be if the, in the next five years while we're paying off this uh, half million dollar portion through operating, it's, like, it's almost like we're borrowing from ourselves and we're paying 
it back over five years. During that five-year period, if there is a request for operating funds from hospice, uh, it, do we have any idea what staff would do with such a request? So I, I don't think that that's a question for staff. I think that would be a question for council. So council's, council's bringing this to us tonight because we directed them to. So. Okay, so I'll just finish by saying that that's, that will be our job. Uh, don't forget, this is an operating expense, and we know how hard operating dollars are to find. So now we've committed half a million to this project over five years, and uh, we should keep that in mind if there are future funding requests. Thank you. Thank you. Next on my list is Deputy Mayor Hill. Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, I just wanted to, this is such a necessary facility for this community and, and so uh, almost late in coming. So I just wanted to acknowledge, uh, uh, I know that the organizing committee and fundraisers are here tonight to acknowledge the incredible hard work that they put into to uh, bringing this to fruition and to the staff for their support in making sure that this happens for Kingston, a very necessary project. So my thanks to all of those folks. Thank you. Councillor Neal. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, totally support this project. I think it's money well spent, and um, I'm sure the ma majority of our constituents would agree with that. Um, I brought this up before. My only concern, but I want to put a little footnote on my concern, is that um, this doesn't become... Uh, precedent setting and we've heard that the last time that we would recall ever council doing this was probably two terms of council ago uh, when we uh, supported a, a project by the Y uh, by the Y I will say we need to find ways given our commitment to affordable housing to be able to uh, incentivize affordable housing. And I just want to say that if there's a mixed affordable housing project that's going up, I would be willing to use a similar approach to be able to lower the costs of the affordable portion of that mixed affordable project. And if that enabled us to add a unit or two to a larger project, I think we're moving towards achieving what we all agreed in our strategic planning session should be a major goal of this government, uh, of municipal government. I will say I'll leave that suggestion in the good hands of the mayor's task force, uh, but that's a, an incentive that I would definitely support. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Chappelle. Thank you through your, your worship. Um, on two points, one, I had an opportunity to review the presentation uh, that, that was presented about four, four weeks ago and clarify some points on the process of this project uh, coming forward and I, I greatly appreciate the fundraising committee and the chair that I spoke with for clarifying that for me today. Complimenting on what uh, Councillor Stroud has said, Understanding that the fundraising and the, the way this is funded, that only seven out of the 10 beds are going to be uh, supported by the province. So it means they have to fundraise in the community continuously. And I am concerned about operating costs and coming back and setting a precedent. And I'm wondering if there's a possibility to add a line in here that basically has it in black and white that this is a one-time, one-off support for the capital. Is there anything we can do with that? So. So I'll address that. Um, there, is, there is no way for council to bind the hands of future councils. So ultimately, at the end of the day, council can make whatever decision it wants, whether it happens to be this council or future councils, uh, regardless of what we may think there. So, um, so any line in that text would have no, no effect. Um, that doesn't take away from your point, Councillor Chappelle. I think that that's a good argument to make around the table, but procedurally there would be no value to that. Okay. Uh, Deputy Mayor, will you take the chair? 
I take the chair and recognize you. Thank you very much. Um, I would just like to say that I would strongly encourage council to support the recommendation that's in front of us. Uh, we had mentioned when this first came before us that Kingston is the largest city in Ontario that does not have a hospice facility. This is such an important need for our community. Uh, and I think there's been some concern about precedent. I think the biggest concern for me was precedent with regards to the number of other requests and asks that come to council table. And we cannot fulfill all of them and still want to achieve our, our fiscal goals. But I think in this case, just to, just to reiterate a couple of things, is that the community support has been tremendous on this. And when you have an organization that is able to achieve 80 to 90% of their fundraising and is just looking for a little extra to get to the finish line, and we have situations where other municipalities have provided these contributions, and when we're providing a contribution that really is just to offset the charges we are already going to impose on the facility, uh, in my view, when you look at how this will still fit in with our fiscal goals to be able to achieve our target tax rates, uh, in my view, this checks all the boxes. So again, I would certainly encourage council to support this, uh, and I look forward to seeing shovels uh, in the ground and seeing that facility uh, constructed. Thank you very much. I return the chair. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? You've already spoken, Councillor Chappelle, unless it's a point of order. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so we will call the vote on Clause 6. And that occurs. Clause 7, 2019, <laughs> 2019 final tax levy and tax rates. We'll call the vote, please. Oh, yes, Councillor Chad. Yeah, no, sorry. Um, this question is about the way that this um, that taxes work. We've talked about this at strategic plan, uh, and and the, the way that the headlines grab, um, you know, the the goal that we set at strategic planning, and then it gets put in. But this particular item actually shows how taxes work. How there's a budget. How it's an, how uh, the, the where do the various uh, pots of money come from, and the different levies, and so on. So I would just um, the most most important part, I, I guess, would be about how the different classes, how it actually plays out on, on, on the ground. And I'm wondering if staff could say about how are we going to communicate the tax increases to the residents? Is it going to be something other than we're increasing your taxes by 2.5%? Ms. Kendi. So I'll start with that, the answer for that. So in terms of the communication, um, we've been working with our communications department and actually already have some information that's gone out um, prior to the meeting tonight. Um, I think there's a couple of messages that we wanted to make very clear. One, um, the budgeted increase that council provided of 2.5% uh, really was 1.5% for our operations and for inflationary impact and 1% of the incremental for capital. So that was the first message. Um, and then the second message, particularly for the residential class, uh, is that at the end of the day when we build in the education, including the, the uh, amount of education tax room that we've built into this calculation, that the average residential tax for 2019 is only 1.84%, not 2.5%. Now, there is a schedule in the report that shows the other classes, um, and there's a couple of them that are above the 25 after education, but that's strictly related to the increases that they're dealing with in their assessment within this four-year period. Okay, so the residential class is 1.84%. Do we have, uh, an, is there, so communication is looking at a number like what the average uh, assessment is and what the 1.84% would mean in additional taxes in dollars. Like, is that $60, $80? Do you have that number? Ms. Kennedy? Through you, Mr. Mayor, for the average residential, which is about 300 and almost 320,000 of assessment is what we use for the average. Um, that works out to about $74 for an, an average tax bill in terms of the, the increase. Okay, great. $74. $74 is a number I can uh, mention to uh, my residents, and, and it's compared to, of course, to the 320,000 average. So, and if, is it, is it a linear scale? So if, if your home is 640,000, would it be $148 then? Through you, Mr. Mayor? Yes, that's correct. 
Great, I can work with that and thank you and good luck to communications for uh, getting that word out and I would suggest using the dollar amount. Thank you. Councillor Chappelle. Looking at, the, this is for, for you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Kennedy. The uh, final tax levy and rates, is there any way in the future or is there any reason why we do not have a levy that specifically mentions debt reduction? Because I'd, I'd really like to see it somewhere how we're servicing debt. Ms. Kennedy. Through you, Mr. Mayor. So the reason that it's not part of this is that our debt payments are not through the operating budget. They're through the capital budget and through our reserve funds. So they're built into the actual capital levy. So the 1% incremental is in the operating budget, goes into our capital reserve funds, and those are the monies that we're using to pay off the debt. So it's not part of the operating budget. Okay. So we will call the vote on Clause 7. And that carries. Okay, on to report number five from Committee of the Whole. Your Worship, I'm pleased to uh, present the Committee of the Whole report number 45 for the consideration of Council. Moved by Deputy Mayor Hill, second by Councillor Osanek, that report number 45 from the Committee of the Whole be received and adopted. So it's just the one clause, Council Strategic Priorities, 2019 to 2022. We'll call the vote, please. Oh, Councillor Hutchison. <clears throat> yes, I wanted to bring something up, which I may be addressing in a future meeting. And it has to do with the nature of the housing, um, the housing um, initiative. And... Um, I want to make sure that I've got this right. Um, it says in the, um, sorry, I've, I've got the paper copy here, but I've also got it written out. So, but anyway, I'll quote it. It says in here that we, we there was originally a motion to, for deferred capital, defined deferred capital, uh, projects with, for $24.2 million. And, uh, and the purpose of that was $6.2 million for roads and sidewalks and $18 million for housing. And added together, $24.2 million. That was, um, staff took that away and did a really good job, actually, of finding $57.1 million in defer deferrals because there are other things that council had identified. I'm carefully watching the acting CAO here. She's nodding so far. So the issue here is that staff identified for housing $4 million that they already had uh, in the capital uh, forecast or schedule and another 3.2 million from a, a previous provincial affordable housing initiative. So the total was 7.2 million. Okay, now the issue here is I think this, talking to other councillors, this might be missed or not entirely appreciated. It says here, and I'm quoting from the, the report, staff are working on identifying other grant opportunities for affordable housing. At this point, it still leaves $10.8 million to be financed through the deferral of other capital projects, which were not identified in either exhibit, okay? Without additional grant funding, there will be limited available budget, in keywords, if any, to fund new and additional affordable housing opportunities over 2019, 2022. Now, the purpose of the original capital deferral motion was to buy the money for roads and sidewalks. I put that in because it was a big concern to other councillors, and for housing. But that did not happen. It went to other things. Now, I'm not saying those other things are not important. They're about electrification of the fleet. They're about safety issues. Okay, you're not going to find me arguing against those. So. 
what, but the original intent of the first motion was not fulfilled. So, and I didn't catch that myself until I started reading it two and three and four times, okay? So, what I'm, what I'm saying is, I will send a motion, I will send a, an email out explaining what I'm talking about to each, to all councillors. But it seems to me we need to find that other deferred funding unless there's some other aspect to it. Because I have little to no faith that we're going to get those um, grant opportunities. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Acting CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. So I, I think this needs some clarification. The first thing that I'd like to clarify, and I appreciate that councillors may not have this full report in front of you, and I apologize for that. But on page 5 of 18 of the report that we provided to, to council, the motion that council passed refers to an amount of up to 24.2 million, including up to $18 million for affordable housing. So I just want to be clear that with the grants that were identified from the province, as well as the dollars that were already allocated for in our capital forecast, we have found $18 million for affordable housing. We also know that council wanted that or had an interest in that $18 million going to 90 units, which I think Councillor Hutchison was quite clear about that in the council meeting. Um, so that 18 million is going to 90 affordable units. So we have that, those dollars allocated for, even if we don't get more money from the federal government or the provincial government. So I wanna make sure that's clear. What we don't have is above and beyond these 90 units that will cost $18 million, give or take, we don't have other dollars identified in the capital forecast for any other affordable housing projects that could come along during that period of time. So we have fulfilled the 18, up to $18 million that council asks us to do. We are going to provide 90 units as council asks us to do. We even identified a property to do that, but we did not include dollars above and beyond that $18 million that council had directed us to provide for. Just so... I'd like uh, to follow up on I that. I understand that. So you still do have one minute on the clock. I'm going to give sure. you that one minute, Councillor Archison. Okay. The only thing I'm going so, to caution, the only thing I'm going to caution, is that this is a talk about the entire strategic plan. We are not getting into a debate and approving a particular housing development or everything else. And so this is really just the direction to that piece. So how does that, Councillor Hodgson, you have Okay, I have no intention of going there. The, the I think the confusing part is, is it says we're, it still leaves 10.8 million to be financed through the deferral of other capital items. And then that doesn't explain that. So can we pause acting CEO Hurdle? Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. So that, that uh, over $10 million is going to be covered by the deferral of $57 million. So we deferred $57 million, and we said we need at least 36.8, I believe if my memory serves me right. As part of that 36.8, we did include the portion for affordable housing that we still needed to leverage because between the grants and dollars that were already allocated for in our capital forecast, we still had a shortfall. So it is, it is covered in that $36.8 million. Okay, fair enough, thanks. Okay, thank you. So we'll call the vote on clause one. And that carries by a vote of 11 to one. Okay, moving on to information reports. If you have a question, just raise your hand as I read through them. Number one, tender and contract awards subject to the established criteria for delegation of authority for the month of March 2019. Number two, Ontario Bill 108, more homes, more choice legislation. No information reports from members of council. Miscellaneous business. Number one, that as requested by Court Kingston, City Council proclaims summer 2019 as Kingston's freshwater sailing festival in the city of Kingston. Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Stroud. Please vote.
and that carries. Number two, we have a we have a motion to receive the resignation of Councillor Hill from the City of Kingston Arts Fund jury be re to receive the regret. But before we can move it, I need another volunteer, Councillor, that could fill in for next Thursday. Do I have a volunteer? Can I ask a question of staff? Is the, de is the date for this jury meeting, is it inflexible? Ms. Campbell? Thank you, and through you. Um, the date has been set for some time now, and all of the other juries are lined up, so I would say that, yes, it would seem fairly inflexible. Is there, is a council representative absolutely required? Ms. Campbell? Thank you, and through you. Um, no, I spoke with the, um, the manager of arts and sector development who works closely with the arts council, and she confirmed that representation from council is not required. There is a staff member who will sit ex officio. Okay, so I think I, I understand part of the issue is that at least six or seven of us are going to be out of town next Thursday, and I know that that's the big issue. So if there's no council volunteer, uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, can I just see you for a moment? So procedurally, what we will do then is we will simply vote on the first clause. Okay, so the motion will simply read that the resignation of Councillor Hill from the City of Kingston Arts Fund jury be received with regret. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Neal, second by Councillor Doherty. Please vote. And that carries by a vote of 11 to 1. Um, moving on to new motions. We have one new motion, moved by Councillor Holland, seconded by Councillor Kiley. Whereas recent proposals to change the structure, service delivery model, and programming of addiction and mental health services, KFLNA, involves divestiture of 15 properties across the city, and whereas the reduction in supportive housing supply threatens to increase the rate of homelessness in the city of Kingston, and whereas the city of Kingston has committed to a 10-year housing and homelessness plan that emphasizes a housing-first approach, that is focused on prioritizing the housing needs of vulnerable residents, ensuring they have access to housing and are provided with other wraparound supports and services, such as attending to mental health issues or addiction issues, only after they have moved into their new residence and achieved some level of housing stability. And whereas the City of Kingston is a direct stakeholder in AMHS services, investing 1,900,000 into a new build project with the agency, Therefore, be it resolved that Council directs staff to report back with information on how the proposed changes will impact the supply of affordable and supportive housing, as well as the City's commitment to ending homelessness on June 18, 2019, and the Council directs staff to report back with recommendations and options for supportive housing to the Housing and Homelessness Advisory Committee later in 2019. Councilor Holland, do you have the floor? Thank you. First, can I just ask that we get it on the screen, just so I can keep track. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so, the uh, just first of all, thank you to staff uh, who have been who have have been working on this issue already, and to councillors Kylie and McLaren and others who have been um, meeting with residents who are quite concerned about this matter. Uh, I'm I'm confident that we will um, that this work would be undertaken without this motion, essentially. Uh, because it is the work, uh, the ongoing work of the Housing and Homelessness Advisory Committee. Uh, and in particular, we've been meeting on the Housing and Homelessness, the 10 year plan for Housing and Homelessness. We're at the midpoint of that work and it requires review. Point of order, and my apologies to interrupt, Councillor Holland. I don't believe that's the right motion. Yeah, that's could right. We, could we get, this was new motion number one from our last meeting. Can I get new motion number one from this meeting, please? We're working on it. Do okay. you, are you able to continue speaking? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Okay. I mean, I, I caught, I caught that, okay. but okay. actually, but anyway. So here I am, uh, oh, two weeks later, and talking about something else. Okay, back on track. So the okay. So the work there's been ongoing work on the issue of supportive housing in the city, both at the committee level and with staff. Um, the changes that we are seeing with AMHS Kingston 
are significant and have the potential to, to significantly impact the work of the committee. The committee has identified two areas for um, a particular focus during this housing and homelessness plan review, and one is Indigenous housing and one is supportive housing. As part of that work, we heard from a number of delegations, I think over a dozen delegations uh, a few months ago, who came to speak to the committee about their concerns, about their work, uh, and they have an ongoing struggle working with clients. So these are providers of supportive housing and, and services related to um, mental health, addictions, um, serving vulnerable, vulnerable populations in the city. Their work is really hampered by the, the lack of affordable housing in the city. This is, of course, something that we've taken on as a council priority, and we're working really hard uh, to that end. But the supportive housing piece, I think the delegation made it very clear why it's so important, um, even though we didn't have a specific discussion about supportive housing when we talked about affordable housing. This is a part that has many, many impacts uh, that we need to be aware of. As has been mentioned, uh, the potential, the ongoing revolving door situation at the hospital emergency rooms, uh, where a number of clients end up going for shelter. Uh, we've worked really hard to eliminate homelessness in the city, and we're, we're moving in the right direction there. And, and potential changes with the, lo the lack of supportive housing available through um, the changing structure of AMHS uh, have, or just a number of, provide a number of areas for concern particularly when it comes to continuing with our commitment to eliminating housing and providing more affordable housing. So looking back, the history of uh, mental health services, mental health care in general, is one in which there was, a, there was a period where there was a move towards deinstitutionalization back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and this was, this was something that came about because of a commitment to human rights. Um, but what ended up happening with this move to coordinated community care was that the supports weren't available and weren't well funded in the community. And we have seen the effects of that over those decades. Um, so obviously Housing First as a model, there's a lot of research behind this, and this model is so important because we, we, we recognize now that the, there's a need to make sure that individuals are safe and secure in their housing before they can resolve any, any other issues related to poverty or addictions or mental health. And th that is exactly what had been provided through these, these various um, um, buildings with all of the, the great supports that frontline staff offer in the city. So I know that the, uh, the entire organization is funded by the LIN and that is something that will continue, uh, but we do have a particular area of concern here as it relates to um, our goals of reducing homelessness and ensuring that uh, the housing for the most vulnerable in Kingston is maintained. So again, I just want to thank the delegation for, for dr uh, drawing our attention to this and to city staff who I know have been working on this uh, and will continue to, to do so. I think it's important nevertheless to have a discussion so that members of the community are aware uh, that we are working on it and that supportive housing is something that is, has been identified already as a really important issue. Thank you. Thank you. We'll call the vote on new motion one. Please vote. And that carries. Are there any notices of motion? Councillor Sanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I will have a notice, a motion that I just want to give notice of tonight on the next agenda, and it's to strike a working group on climate action. Um, the working group, it will be very short term. It will be working on a list of very specific actions that are quick wins that can be brought to council in early Q4. So just a heads up that that motion will be on the next agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Deputy Clerk, ask for minutes, please. Moved by Councillor Holland, second by Deputy Mayor Hill, that the minutes of City Council meeting number 2019-14, held Wednesday, May 8th, 2019, be confirmed. Please vote. Waiting for one, please. And that carries. Uh, we have a number of communications. Is there any other business? Madam Deputy Clerk, ask for bylaws, please. 
Moved by Councillor Kiley, seconded by Councillor Osanek that bylaws number one, four, and five be given their first and second reading. Please vote. And that carries. Moved by Councillor Kiley, seconded by Councillor Osanek, that Clause 11.36 of Bylaw Number 2010-1 be suspended for the purpose of giving Bylaw Number 4 three readings. Please vote. And that carries. Motion to adjourn, please. Oh, Mr. Mayor, there's one more. Oh, oh I apologize. Oh, on the edits. Yes, uh, so moved by Mr. Kiley, second by Councillor Osanek, that bylaws number two through five begin their third reading. Please vote. And that carries. Motion to adjourn, please. Moved by Councillor Chappelle, second by Councillor Doherty. Please vote. And we are adjourned. Thank you very much.